is the WTF Bach Podcast. Right, that work goes fingers. This is the podcast about all things Johann Sebastian Bach. Brought to you by Evan Shinners. WTF Bach. Brought to you by Evan Shinners. Join WTF Bach as he guides your mind through a contrapuntal journey. And now, and now here's WTF Bach. Hi, it's Evan Shinners. You can call me WTF Bach. The goal of this podcast is to get you to hear Bach the way I hear Bach. The impetus for such a program is to guide your ears, to set your mind on certain aspects of an otherwise very complicated music. And I'm going to help you appreciate this ornate, beautiful, elaborate music by breaking it down, dissecting it, and then putting it back together. You will listen to Bach's music once, with little or no prior knowledge, and again, knowing exactly what to listen for. I believe in doing this because Bach's music, like so many forms of great art, while capable of being appreciated on the surface, only becomes more and more profound with study. When I heard this music, I examined something of what it would be to be God just before the creation of the world. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said that. Bach made me dedicate my life to music. Nina Simone said that. If you want to see the potential of humanity, study Bach. I said that. Listen up. Let's do it. Let's delve right into the first contrapunctus from the art of fugue. Now, it is a fugue. Bach calls them contrapunctuses because, as we discussed in the previous episode, a fugue is a type of counterpoint. And yes, contrapunctus is the Latin word for counterpoint. And yes, Bach was a Latin teacher. As I hope to convince you in the following podcast, the Art of Fugue is really a work for harpsichord, though because the piano didn't exist in those days, it is impossible to tell whether or not Bach would have enjoyed hearing it on the piano, but moreover, it's sort of irrelevant to have that discussion because this is a different instrument, the harpsichord, from the piano. I think it's a reverent gesture and an important step for our ears to first hear this first fugue on the harpsichord, just so we can soak up a bit of that what people imagine to be authentic sound. So you will hear this first fugue with entrances coming first in the alto, followed by the soprano, then in the bass, then the final entrance of the exposition is the tenor. Now I covered those terms in the previous podcast, but those four words, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, could be just briefly touched on. In order from highest voice to lowest voice, they are soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. And the study of the words is sort of fascinating. Alto, which is the second highest voice, simply means high, right? So this this was a high voice. Uh, it could have been sung by a man. Sometimes today men sing alto parts, but more often than not, a woman will sing the alto voice. Soprano is above, it's sopra, the alto. So that's the highest voice. And then tenor, which is between the alto and the bass, is sort of like if you speak Spanish, tener, it means to hold. So what are we holding? Well, the tenors in early church music were the people who held the important chant melodies. So that's why we call them tenors, because they were holding the important melodies, and everyone knows what the bass is. So Bach, rather than bringing them in in strict order, say from bottom to top or top to bottom, does, as I said, first alto, then in the soprano, then in the bass, and then in the tenor. The sound of the harpsichord is a bit of an acquired taste, so if you wish to skip this recording and hear me go straight into the discussion of this fugue, this recording is three minutes long. But like most things that are acquired tastes, it is well worth acquiring the taste. If you have keen ears, you will hear 11 entrances. So let's listen to the masterful Robert Hill playing on the harpsichord, the first counterpoint from the Art of Fugue. And Robert, if you're listening, I definitely want to study with you. Thank you. 
Now, what makes that playing so beautiful for me is his independence of the lines. There are four voices in that fugue, and with each one, he has such expert control, and it moves, each line moves at its own pace, just as four singers would be moved to sing with four individual minds. And I think that always the truest Bach playing keeps that in mind. The fact that though computers can make great renditions of this music, the truest Bach playing takes into account the enormous sense of rubato that I imagined Bach had, this freedom with which he played his music. And more and more I see this sense of rubato, which was quite lost, I would say, for about a half of a century, coming back into the modern Bach minds. Now, I also played this music for you first on a harpsichord because you have to understand that a harpsichord cannot play softer or louder depending on how hard you strike the key. It's a fixed mechanism that plays at one fixed volume no matter how weakly or strongly you play the keys. And this is very important to the understanding of fugues played on the harpsichord or the organ, which is similar. You cannot, as it were, bring out this voice here or show where the melody is here or color this section differently. Everything is really black and white. And that's why I often use the analogy of sketching and painting, because piano playing is certainly the art of coloring, filling in certain lines with various colors, and often the bigger your palette of color, the greater the pianist you are. But the harpsichord? Ah, that is the art of sketching with a pencil. You have to learn how to imply the same colors with just one color, and this is the great art of harpsichord playing. Now, you see, for the same reason you cannot bring out certain voices, you cannot bring out the subject, the theme. So in the first contrapuntus, in the first fugue, we have 11 entrances of the subject, but some of them are much harder to hear than others because some of them are simply more buried in the texture. So if you heard all 11 entrances, congratulations, you are a natural Bachian. But if you didn't, which is more to be expected, that's kind of the point. Bach doesn't hit you over the head with the subject every time. It's a beautiful musical composition, but the subject is there, even if you don't hear it clearly. But by the end of this podcast, you will know where all 11 entrances are. Now, let's go back and listen to the end of this recording from the 11th entrance of the subject, which is in the tenor voice. You'll hear it like this. Did you hear it? Keep listening. Now, did you hear the birds at the end of the recording there? That's because the harpsichord, unlike the piano, which might function well in a recording studio, only functions best in its natural acoustic space, like a chapel or empty church or something like that. So we have this nice image of Mr. Hill in the hills, somewhere in Montana, playing the Art of Fugue. Now, the other thing I want you to hear is how the ends of the harpsichord notes have this clipped noise, how they go when they are released. When the harpsichordist removes his or her fingers from the keys, they sort of have this hiccup. You can especially hear those little clips at the ends of the short final chords towards the end of the fugue there. You hear that little that clicking noise. And this is due to the action of the harpsichord. This is before the sophisticated action of the piano, which has a hundred parts per key. Yes, when you touch a piano key, you are setting into motion about a hundred moving parts, which is amazing. But the harpsichord, still very complicated, has about 17 moving parts per key. And the clavichord, earliest of all keyboard instruments, has only a handful of parts. But the harpsichord is an instrument where the keys pluck the string on the way up. Now, in the back of these keys, there are these things that we call a plectrum. That's the same thing as a guitar pick, actually. But it's attached to the back part of the harpsichord key, and it plucks the strings. But in order for this key to be brought back down into its original resting position, the plectrum has to pass over the string again, and therefore sound the string again, which is what you're hearing when you hear this harpsichord release. Did you hear it right there? I'll loop it a few times just to isolate it. Now, instrument makers have been known to be some of the greatest geniuses of the world. Think about a name like Stradivarius. The reason that the plectrum going over the string on the way up doesn't sound the same way as it does on the way down is because of this exceedingly clever harpsichord mechanism. You have a movable part in the middle of each key called the tongue, 
which allows the plectrum to slide just a little bit on the way down, therefore softening the impact and it is instantly stifled by this felt damper. And that is what you hear when the harpsichord releases a key. And for those of you just curious to know where an 18th century harpsichord maker would have gotten this nice little piece of plastic to use as a plectrum, well, the answer is birds. That's right. Before plastic, they used quills from crows, ravens, sometimes vultures. I think we have sort of forgotten how many animals there are within each of these instruments. I mean, so many animal parts. I'm thinking right now about the strings. So if you want to quickly blow your mind, do a quick search on how to make gut strings because we still use gut strings today. And how do you think they're made? That's right, sheep. I got a little sidetracked talking about the harpsichord and its action. So right now let's get back to the Bach and do the first contrapuntus from the Artifugue. I'm going to play it and sort of speak over it at the same time so that we can see its construction. First, the theme in the alto voice. This is the beloved theme we all know and love. Its answer is here in the soprano. And now in the bass. Finally in the tenor. And with this entrance finishing here, we now have finished the exposition and embark on this episode. Nothing here but episodic material, no theme, except now in the alto. And as soon as this entrance finishes, we have another episode here shorter this time because the soprano comes in here with the theme. And sort of a sneaky bass entrance here. Episode. Notice the wandering quality of the episodes. There's tenor right here. In the tenor. And another episode, wandering, striving, and sort of a fake entrance in the alto here, usurped by the real entrance in the soprano there. And again, an episode. No subject until the base. And we are now in the longest episode here. The longest one, the most dramatic. Notice the bass note sustained. Go to the final part with the chords, which you remember from the harpsichord version. We've had ten entrances so far, and here's the eleventh in the tenor. Okay, so I trust you'll forgive a little bit of the playing there, because when you're trying to explain and play at the same time, you sometimes sacrifice a bit of the playing. But that is essentially the construction of this first fugue, where the entrances were. But you still really can't hear the voices separate. So for this next part, I would suggest listening on headphones, or at least having two speakers that are sort of somewhat apart from each other, because I've created a version of the Art of Fugue in which you can hear every voice in separate areas of your headphones. 
uh, which is something you can only do truly with electronics because if you're just playing on one piano, it's sort of impossible to filter out the independence of the voices completely. But uh, this next section, you will have the privilege of hearing the voice is truly isolated. The alto in the left speaker, the soprano in the right. That can be a little tough on the brain, uh, so if you enjoy it, uh, that means that you have a good contrapuntal brain. If you don't, it's okay, we're not going to hear much of that. But I think what's great about this is you can really truly hear the independence of the line, and you can hear the conversation, the one line going ba-bum, ba-bum, and the other one answering ba-bum, ba-bum. You know, you can really hear how they are speaking together. So now let's do another one where we have the first two voices in one speaker and the bass entering in yet another speaker. Maybe it's being built up in your mind as the recognizable composition that we've been listening to in this episode. What I like about that entrance in the bass is that right after it states the subject, it just takes a breath, which you can completely do in a fugal texture. Certain voices can rest, where it's as if one of the people in the conversation just get tired of speaking and they just want to listen. Let's hear that one more time, that rest in the bass. You hear them come in, you hear them drop out, you hear them come back in. Okay, now the final one, where we will hear the previous three voices coming in one speaker, and we will isolate the fourth voice, which is the tenor. And we're going to start it just a little later, because the tenor is the last voice to enter. That's three voices there. tenor voice in your left speaker, the rest of them in your right speaker. And now, just for fun, let's take the final episode from this fugue, and let's put the highest and the lowest voices in your left speaker, and the middle two voices in your right speaker. So, if you can do this, I would maybe take one headphone out and listen to two voices in one, and then put it back in, or turn one speaker off. You know, really, really experiment with this, and see if you can hear the top and the bottom voices in your left speaker, and the middle voices in your right speaker. Right there with the fade out is where that final 11th entrance of the fugue subject would come in, in the tenor. So that little last bit there with the two voices in your one speaker and two voices in the other speaker was all episodic material. There was no entrance of the theme. It was all just counterpoint without the subject. Right, that fugue. Now this first fugue in the Art of Fugue is about as straightforward as a fugue in the Art of Fugue can get. It is called a simple fugue, which means that it is a fugue on a single subject. As we'll see as we get more and more involved into this world of the Art of Fugue, there will be fugues with two subjects, three subjects, and even finally four subjects. But this subject, this re la fa re do re mi fa so fa mi re that subject will be there every single time in many in many different shapes in many expansions of the idea in many contractions of the idea but it'll always be there finally a note must be made about the so-called proper way and the authentic way to perform bach and whereas i do feel that there is both an authentic and a proper way to perform Bach, 
And I do feel like it is our duty as musicians to understand which way that is. It is also our duty as a musician regarding the spirit of Bach to be open to the ways in which technology and the modern spirit have both created new ways for us to hear Bach. Bach himself was just completely transfixed with the direction that music was moving in. And he, among musicians of his era, was the most modern, constantly striving to be on the cutting edge of what was happening in music. And he was so ahead of the curve, he predicted trends in music that wouldn't happen for another 200 years. He was also Janus looking backwards and forwards at the same time, looking to Palestrina, looking to the old masters. So I feel like as a true Bachian, with the true spirit of Bach, we must embrace where music is going, where it is, which is certainly in the electronic realm, and we must also look backwards and understand and appreciate the historically accurate performance. It's sort of like anything that people feel so passionate about, say like a religious text or something like that. There's there's going to be warring camps, people on the other side fighting tooth and nail to assert their view, but I really feel like they need each other. And if this podcast could accomplish anything, it would be to satisfy the purists and the avant-gardists and have them sort of unite somewhere in the middle. But again, the wonderful thing about this music, it is so indestructible in its construction that it can lend itself to a great many interpretations. And so at the end of this podcast now, I would like to play for you this same contrapunt as we've been discussing in this episode as I arranged it when I was 16 years old. Yeah, I told you in the first episode, I've been just in love with this work, if not obsessed by this work since I was a boy and I was in a rap group back then. I was called Slim E. Bach was just the best person to make beats to because there's something, again, that's just so indestructible in his rhythm, in his harmony, that even hip-hop artists today, actually a great many hip-hop artists today, you'd be surprised, use Bach as uh, the sample. And now your goal when listening to this is to count 11 entrances. Stay tuned for the end of the episode because we have some important information for you and I look forward to hearing from you on email or in the comments. Please spread this podcast, it's brand new, and stick around for the next episode in which I aim to dissect Contrapuntus 2 and Contrapuntus 3. And now the 16-year-old Evan Shinners.
Thanks so much for listening. We're a brand new podcast and we, we want to hear, hear from, from you. you. Got suggestions? Want Evan to analyze a specific piece of Bach? Have any other questions for Evan about music or anything at all? Do you want to partner with the WTF Bach podcast? Write to us. B-A-C-H at WTFBach.com. Help keep this podcast alive. Porta. Porta. Send us a donation on Venmo, Cash App, or PayPal at WTF Bach. Evan Shinners is the founder of New Call Incorporated, a 501c3 nonprofit which performs classical music in atypical venues. Find a playlist of the music referenced in this episode. Check the episode descriptions. And we would be remiss if we didn't thank you for listening to the WTF Bach podcast. <laughs>